the last large country to say that it would not pay its debts, let's be real clear here, was Argentina. The beginning of this decade, the last decade, the beginning of the new millennium, Argentina experienced a terrible economic collapse. And one of the things that happened was that it could not pay its debts. So it said to the world, including many banks here in the United States, uh, not going to pay you. <laughs> Hello, we're not paying you. Now, you have it two ways. They sat down with the bankers. You can either, either work something out with us or... You get nothing. And we're prepared, the Kirchner government, we're prepared to mobilize the mass of people in Argentina. And not only will you not get your money back, but you're going to have a very unpleasant time in this country for the next 50 years. You probably don't want that. So let's sit down. Make a long story short. The banks scream. The American government scream. You must honor your debt. No one will ever lend to you again. They paid 60 cents on the dollar. And they're doing fine. Everybody's lending to Argentina like it never happened. So when you're told these things can't be done, no, 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 don't do that. that that's mistaking a gambit in a negotiation for a fixed impossibility. That's falling for the other guy's argument when you really ought to be savvier than that. Greece is not going to pay its debts. Everyone is involved, knows it. There's just an elaborate theater on the way to it. So if American corporations were to say, if you taxed us, we're going to leave, then the answer is, if you even think of doing that, we will come down on you. We will put, an ex we will put a tax on your departure. We, we, you'll leave but you'll be the shell of the corporation you once were. Are you sure you want to do this? This is not about what's feasible. This is about whether you have the political strength. You really are. I mean, I don't mean to be crude, but you are a dupe if you take seriously these arguments about what they're going to do if we begin to demand of them what it is many of you think of. Let me remind you the last one of it. The income tax of the highest wealth category in this country is currently 35%. If you make above a certain amount, the highest percentage of that money you have to pay to the federal government as, a, as an income tax is 35%. Right? 30 years ago, it was 90%. Don't tell me what is possible in the United States. That was not a different universe 30 years ago. That was a different America with different part of the population involved in politics. If it was possible then, it's possible now. And if we did it now, the amount of money coming into the government would change all of the calculations that are now considered to be unthinkable, impossible. They didn't leave when the tax rate was 91%, those corporate executives. They're not going to leave now either. And if they were to suggest to do that, then we would all get together and see what counterproposals we might suggest that would make them think twice. What have we had over the last year and a half, two years? We've had unprecedented amounts of money basically given to corporations. General Motors, AIG, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Along the way, again, you need a sense of humor. Along the way, remarkable little moments. In the height of the crisis, it was said, we have a terrible problem in America. We have banks that are, remember the phrase, too big to fail. So the government, therefore, must rescue them because they're too big to fail. What do we have now? We had two before that were too big to fail. Bank of America, for example, and Merrill Lynch. Two companies too big to fail. What did the government do? Ready? Merged them. <laughs> Wells Fargo was too big to fail, and Wachovia, a very big bank, was too big to fail. And what have we done with them? Mm -hmm. Merged them. We now have entities that are bigger than they were when the crisis began. I told you, you needed a sense of humor. <laughs> Remember, the system we live in is called capitalism. And what I've been describing 
is what it delivers. The mass of people unemployed, real wages continuing to be flat to trending down. Nothing prevents wages from going up so much as having millions of people looking for work that will be ready to work at less than whatever it is you're paying to people who already have the job. We have no recovery for the mass of people. We haven't had any. The tragedy in America is only that the masses of people who are not participating in the recovery, by reading about it in the press every day, think the fault lies with them as individuals rather than in a system that produced this crisis in the first place and now can't fix it and hasn't a clue. Why is this important? Because in the world as it is and in this country, the government didn't do any of that. It didn't tax the rich. Instead, it borrowed all the money. And because it, excuse me, because it borrowed all the money, it now confronts a situation in Washington and in all 50 states and in all cities that it has an enormous interest cost. It has to pay interest on all that borrowing. And that means a huge portion of the taxes you and I pay to the city, to the state, to the federal government is not used to provide any service we need or want, but rather the government functions as a collection agency. It collects it from us and passes it on to those who lent to the government. And here comes the best part. Who lends to the government? Well, the answer is obvious. The only people with the resources to lend to the government are the people who weren't taxed, who instead of paying a tax to the government, lend the money to them. At this point, if we had more time, I'd stop speaking and simply play the national anthem. (laughs) But we don't have the time, so you'll have to imagine the Star Spangled Banner without 